Welcome to this global public lecture series, Decolonizing Law, exploring the relationships between law, race, imperialism, colonialism, anti-imperialism, and de-anti-postcolonialism. I'm Ralph Wild from UCL. This series offers a stellar all-women lineup of amazing speakers. Already we've heard from Vasuki Nasaya, Liliana Obregon, and Mindy Chen Wishart. And to come, we have Aicha Shubuchku, Fabia Fernandez Cavallo, Amaya Alves, and Vidya Kumar. Past lectures have addressed colonial reparations, international law in the Americas, and racism in universities. Future lectures will address decolonizing the idea of humanity, intervention in Latin America, nature rights and the Chilean constitution, and revolution in international law. All are welcome to attend live and recordings of most of the lectures will be posted online. I'd like to offer my warmest thanks to my fantastic colleagues, Lisa Penfold, Jessica Luong and Daniel McFarlane at UCL Laws for their outstanding work setting up the practicalities and of and the publicity for these lectures. Lisa, Jess and Danielle, I'm very grateful to you. Today, I'm delighted to introduce my dear friends, Tendaya Chumi and Asla Bali, two of the most original and important thinkers in international law today. Both are professors at UCLA. Tendai has done groundbreaking work on a range of subjects, including migration, on which she and I have an ongoing collaboration as part of a group of scholars in this field and where she has made a truly game-changing set of arguments on race, migration, and reparations. She's also making a vitally important global impact as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Asla and I have been friends since we overlapped as students a quarter of a century ago. And just as I was blown away by her staggering intellect then, I've, been, I've marveled at her acutely insightful work since, providing analysis of the highest order on fundamental subjects such as nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, where she's brilliantly synthesized insights from legal doctrine, international relations, political theory, contemporary politics, and history. It's really almost an embarrassment of riches to have both Tendai and Asla here today. They'll be speaking on the intersections between critical race theory and third world approaches to international law, 12. Do ask questions or make comments using the Q&A function on Zoom. I'll put these to our speakers uh, without mentioning the identity of the questioner, which I'm told isn't possible for data protection reasons. That will happen at the end of the presentation. So my friends, I'm delighted you're here and greatly looking forward to your remarks. Thank you so much, um, Ralph. And I'm going to start us off. It's really a pleasure to be joining you today. And I'm sure Asla uh, shares the sentiment as well. Um, we're going to be presenting jointly. And so I'm going to begin with some background and an outline before turning to the substance of the presentation. And I want to note that our presentation is based on an article that we published in the UCLA Law Review um, that came out of a number of symposia that we convened in 2019 and 2020, and that resulted in the publication of about 15 articles in the UCLA Law Review from different authors, all methodologically committed to treating race and empire as an analytically productive and international legal scholarship, especially scholarship related to equality, subordination, um, and domination. Um, our article, the one that we're going to be talking about today, and the broader convenings related um, specifically to, the, to an encounter between third world approaches to international law and critical race theory, 
to critical intellectual traditions with which we both identify. And in our presentation, we'll offer a brief overview of TWAIL, Third World Approaches to International Law, and CRT, Critical Race Theory. And then we'll also discuss our motivations for encouraging scholarship at this intersection of these two approaches. And then also have a case study uh, focusing on counterterrorism and intervention law and policy in Libya to illustrate the value or the necessity of accounting for race and empire and international legal um, analysis. And we encourage members of the audience to take a look both at our article, which is titled the same way as our presentation, Race and Empire Legal Theory Within, Through and Across National Borders, as well as the other articles included in that symposium issue, um, which are just a truly rich analysis that I think um, really exemplifies the kind of value that, that we see at this intersection. And we can make the link to the law review article available to, to Ralph to post on the website, since I can't post it in the chat. So with that background, I'm going to turn now to a brief introduction to, to Twail before turning to Asa for a brief introduction to uh, CRT. There are, of course, many different approaches and methods associated with international legal theory and analysis. And TWAIL itself is best understood as one of its founders, Professor James Gathi has explained, as an expansive, heterogeneous, and polycentric dispersed network and field of study. So within TWAIL, the concept of the third world is central. And as Professor Balakrishna and Rajagopal has noted, the third world is, and I quote here, a counter hegemonic discursive tool that allows us to interrogate and to contest the various ways in which geopolitical power is used. And so it's a category that enables fundamental diagnosis and critique of international law and its operation, and that opens up meaningful, even if imperfect opportunities for shoring up the emancipatory potential of international law. Um, Twail is, is less about dogmatic insistence on the third world as a stable or unchanging, well-defined geographic or even geopolitical formation. And it's more about flexible but focused attention to the third world as tracking a common experience of political, economic, and social subordination in the global hierarchy um, of power relations. And, and then finally, as powerfully articulated also by James Gathy, the third world is also a subaltern epistemic location. That is a, a site of knowledge production about international law that aims to disrupt dominant approaches, which to this day will often explicitly or implicitly treat the West as the only legitimate um, and plausible source of international legal um, knowledge. So the TWAIL umbrella unifies scholars with diverse interests and methodologies. And so, you know, we wouldn't presume to say that in our um, analysis, we're going to exhaust the field of, of the different um, approaches that different TWAIL scholars take. Um, but typically at the core of, of a TWAIL approach is, is um, the foundational premise that international law cannot be understood or analyzed apart from its mutually constitutive relationship with empire, specifically European colonialism and its enduring contemporary legacies. And it's this that's at the core of, of uh, TWAIL analysis. Um, TWAIL's contributions to international legal scholarship range from illuminating how historical antecedents of modern international law embodied in advanced colonial logics of racialized exploitation, expropriation, and extermination. And they also include deconstructing the contemporary legacies of these antecedents in different fields of international law. And some scholars have focused on reconceptualizing law to disrupt its embedded hierarchies of power. So I mentioned this to highlight that there's also constructive thread that runs through um, TWAIL as well beyond just um, critique. Um, and so I'll conclude by saying that a common thread within TWAIL that's, that's salient for our analysis is its critical foregrounding of empire past and present, um, not just colonialism alone. And, and we define empire for our purposes loosely as social, political, and economic interconnection among sovereign nations, but on unequal terms that structurally benefit powerful nations while structurally disadvantaging and exploiting subordinated nations as well. And there are many rich uh, repositories of, of TWAIL resources. You can consult our article for, and the symposium for different references, but I also want to highlight um, the TWAILA website. So T-W-A-I-L-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R
T-W-A-I-L-R, um, which was launched in 2019 and just has a wealth of resources for those of you who are interested in, in understanding TWAIL better. So I'll stop here and, and turn over to Asa. Great. Thanks so much, Tendai, for getting us started. And thanks also to Ralph for organizing this fantastic lecture series and for inviting us to speak. And I also want to extend all of our thanks to Lisa, Jess, and Danielle, who have done so much work on planning to make this series happen. Uh, so I'm picking up just where uh, Tendai dropped off uh, to look at what is the critical race theory side of the equation of the conversation that we um, invited in the symposium that she described and that we tried to also stage in our own intervention. And as one might imagine, there's much overlap in the premises and analytic foci of critical race theory and TWAIL with the two traditions having long been in conversation with one another. This is in part true because of the influence of critical legal studies on the pathbreaking intellectuals who were really the leaders of both movements uh, and who share a kind of founding origin story uh, in their own engagements with critical legal studies, oftentimes at the same universities and working with the same faculties, and therefore really beginning um, in you know, the late 80, 1980s, early 1990s, by at the domestic level and at the global level, staging a set of conversations that bring critical insights to bear on both structural discrimination domestically and also the ways in which the international legal system ha has been structured to subordinate in precisely the way that Tendai just described. It's also the case that these two intellectual movements have had many occasions um, over the decades in which um, they have come back into conversation with one another, whether through shared research agendas that have been developed through conferences like our own or in scholarly collaborations between particular um, leading figures in the field. Here, to briefly introduce the CRT, the critical race theory lens, I would start by saying that CRT understands race as a social construction through which ascriptive characteristics are invested with social, political, economic, and legal meaning. And uh, the tradition, CRT, considers race as the central analytic category for understanding the operation of structural discrimination in domestic law, much as uh, Tendai just described, empire being the central analytic focus for TWAIL. At the international level, indeed, TWAIL has grappled with binaries that also encompass racial division, or what in a different moment might be best described as the global color line, including the ways in which international law has historically structured, been structured around categories of European, non-European, colonized or colonized, and civilized, uncivilized, all of which are thin proxies, at least in some circumstances, for a broader racial structuring of the international system. Because these binaries are deeply racialized, but also tied up with imperial histories in which the central discriminatory function of law had to do both at the domestic and the international level with the distribution of entitlements, it's obvious why TWAIL and CRT would very much benefit from uh, being in sort of continuous conversation with one another. Of course, much of the scholarship on the social construction of race and the role of law in defining and institutionalizing racialized structural discrimination has had its origins in the study of American law, that is US law. But CRT has also traveled far beyond the US with scholarly engagements and global applications of critical race theory to everything from the experiences of Afro-descendant communities in South America, to Dalit communities in India, to immigrant communities in Europe, to xenophobic discrimination in Africa. So there are many global dimensions to CRT, which in and of themselves invite engagement with TWAIL. The specific focus on the role of law in constituting and continually reproducing racial subordination, even in contexts where commitments to formal equality are constitutionally entrenched, a set of arguments that CRT has developed to enormous effect, uh, parallel the account in TWAIL scholarship of ongoing relations of imperial subordination, even in the midst, again, of formal sovereign equality. This is one of many respects in which CRT and TWAIL offer twinned analyses of analogous dynamics operating in the domestic and international spheres. Indeed, many of the core concerns of CRT have easily recognizable correlates that have been of enormous interest to scholars in the TWAIL tradition from the outset. And to offer just a few examples in closing on the sort of value brought 
by adopting a CRT lens, CRT has worked to problematize and resist the strategies of erasure that obscure the role of race in histories of expropriation, dispossession, and enslavement uh, through the deployment of legal fictions of contemporary equality in the US domestic context and far beyond. And these very dynamics that occurred, of course, within the settler colonial history of the United Nation, of, excuse me, the United States, um, are obviously part of a much broader imperial picture. CRT scholars have also explicitly addressed the politics of knowledge production within the United States, pedagogical erasure that takes place on two fronts, both in addressing who is authorized to serve as, the, as an expert in the, in the production of knowledge, and also what subjects are the appropriate foci of expert knowledge. And of course, it is also fundamental to CRT scholarship and intellectual community that the work in this tradition of critical race contribute to a reconstructive project, which picks up on the last point uh, Tendai made on Twail. In CRT too, the scholarly approach is predicated on developing a critique that is committed to transformation within and through law, even as intellectual engagements within the CRT tradition also appreciate the limitations of a strategy to achieve change through law. Thus, in the CRT tradition, uh, it is uh, typical for scholars to be devoted to not only generating tools of critical engagement for the advancement of an intellectual project, but also directly to empower advocates. And here I mean advocates not only to encompass lawyers or legal reform, but also at the level of social movements. And so CRT is an advocacy project as well as an intellectual project and a legal reform project that embraces a reconstructive agenda, even as it is um, staging one of the most important fundamental critiques of the operation of law in the domestic system. And with that, I'll turn to uh, Tendai to frame uh, the conversation between Twail and CRT that we invited. Thanks, um, Asla. And I have to say, one of the joys of, of doing this lecture is getting to do it with you. Um, so as, as Asla has, has laid out, there are so many natural synergies between Twail and CRT, even of course, even if there may be some tensions as well. And um, I want to talk a little bit about what motivated our um, work at UCLA and beyond to really um, foster conversations at the intersection of these two frames. Uh, as Asla mentioned already, I I think it's important to highlight that race and racial subordination have long been a focus of work in Twail, and this focus has been implicit in some projects and explicit in others. And if you look at foundational work in the Twail canon, it can be understood as unpacking the racial character of colonialism and the foundational role of empire in making international law. Um, but with respect to critical race theory um, in particular, one of the, or, or in some ways, the leading antecedent event to the ones that I'm going to be describing that we hosted is a conference that was hosted in 2000 by Professor Ruth um, Gordon, where she at Villanova invited um, a group of scholars, many of whom were Twail scholars, to think about CRT in the context of international law. And for those of you in the, in the audience who are really interested in these two approaches and the method of CRT, the way that it applies to international law, and, and then also Twail as well, I, I strongly encourage you to take a look at Professor Gordon's article in that Villanova Law Review article, and then also the other articles that came out of that symposium, which in many ways exemplify um, the generative intersection between um, Twail and, and CRT. Um, in any case, in March 2019, we hosted um, a conference and a workshop at UCLA um, with the explicit aims of bringing TWAIL and CRT scholars into conversation around the two themes. And, and as I mentioned, Asla and I both identify with both of these approaches and we thought it would be productive to create space for further dialogue among people who, who work at this intersection or in one or the other. Um, the first of our events was a symposium entitled Critical Perspectives on Race and Human Rights, Transnational Reimaginings. And I, I highlight this convening because in the wake of the racial justice uprisings of 2020, um, uh, uh, there's been many discussions around the role of human rights in, in addressing um, racial justice. And, and the, the symposium that we hosted actually, I think, um, 
helps for legal scholars, especially international legal scholars. Um, it gives them a language and a vocabulary for dealing with some of these questions in the tradition of TWIL and CRT. So if you look at our article again, we have links to that symposium and the videos that came out of it and the articles that came out of it as well. But specifically, it, it focused on critical consideration of the human rights frame and its role in the pursuit of racial justice um, and equality. In, in broad terms, the international human rights movement anchored in the global north and even international human rights scholars have failed both to name and to confront racial injustice, um, notwithstanding the ascendance of the human rights frame. And so our goal was to bring together leading TWAIL and CRT scholars, early career scholars, and even the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights for a perspective from within the global human rights machinery. And what we were trying to do was to foster a transnational conversation among domestic and international legal scholars and to incubate an, an, a network of multidisciplinary academics who were interested in advancing critical, reconstructive, and even radical engagement with, with the human rights frame um, broadly constructed. And so a number of articles were published that came out of that symposium um, issue that we hosted, and, and they were published in the, in the UCLA Journal of International Law and, and Foreign Affairs. And then the second convening that we hosted um, was a smaller workshop that ended up uh, being tied to the 2020 symposium issue that I already mentioned and that our article is taken from, where again we invited TWAIL and CRT scholars to bring their respective frames to bear on race, empire, and international law more broadly. So not just focusing on on human rights, but thinking about public international law more broadly. And that smaller workshop delved um, more deeply into convergences and divergences between TWAIL and CRT and interrogated the history of transnational legal analysis and political mobilization challenging racial domination. And, and for those of you who are interested in some of the nuances of the intersection of TWAIL and CRT. There's at least two articles in, in the UCLA Law Review um, Symposium issue, which is, I think it's volume 67, that actually gets into TWAIL and CRT side by side in, in, in really interesting um, detail. And so participants also interrogated some of the very premises that had motivated the convening. For example, we asked, can we meaningfully talk about race globally or transnationally? Or must race always be engaged locally? Can we talk about empire and even European colonialism in global terms when important distinctions in here, for example, in settler and non-settler colonial projects? Um, ultimately, however, the scholarship that resulted from these convenings took on the charge of illustrating the value of bringing a combined TWAIL CRT lens to bear on the traditional preoccupations of international law. And so what is distinctive about a TWAIL and CRT lens is simultaneous attention to empire as a transnational project of sovereign interconnection structured by geopolit geopolitical hierarchy and attention to race as an analytic of subordination, including um, through law. And so it's this intersection that we were interested in, in really mining. And to give you a sense of what difference it makes to, to, to do scholarship at that intersection, I'm going to turn it over to Asla, who will talk through one of the case studies that we address in, in our article. Thanks so much again, Tendai. And I can only say what a pleasure it is to share a platform with you with only the slight caveat that then it means I need to rise to your level each time I engage. And so anyway, thank you so much for setting that up so beautifully. Uh, so as Tendai said, we engaged a case study in bringing TWAIL and CRT into conversation. We were interested in working through an example of the payoff of centering race as an analytically productive category for examining the ways in which international legal regimes continue to be shot through with imperial dynamics. So we provided an examination of the 2011 internationally authorized military intervention in Libya and its aftermath as illustrative of the imbricated logics of race and empire that are at work in how law mediates, structures, and amplifies the asymmetries and forms of subordination that continue to define global hierarchy, its allocations of rights and privileges, and the respective vulnerabilities that are attendant to it for populations across the world. In this vein, we analyze the distinctive means by and purposes for which Libya was framed as alternately a site for humanitarian rescue and incubator of terrorist threat. And finally, the terrain for erecting an extraterritorial European border for migration control. Throughout our analysis, we highlight the profoundly contingent 
character of Libyan sovereignty and the racial constructions that legitimized intervention, management and control over and in the name of the Libyan people. So we begin with the intervention itself and the ways in which the so-called responsibility to protect doctrine was deployed uh, in, the, in the context of Libya. And here we might say that this is an example of the deployment of a racial frame of barbarism to ground, legitimize, and offer a legal framework for intervention. So we go through in the article the ways in which Qaddafi was described in almost classically 19th century terms as a savage and brutal leader that had to be countered in a way to reaffirm and assert the prerogatives of the international system and the demands of humanity. Um, he, in establishing this characterization of Qaddafi, there was much made of his deployment of um, allegedly mercenaries who themselves were characterized racially. So any individual uh, that was phenotypically black was described as a mercenary operating at Qaddafi's command, notwithstanding the very complicated racial makeup of the Libyan population. And by contrast, the non-black Libyans were presented as civilians in need of rescue from Qaddafi. In the meantime, the fact that the country was actually divided and that there was an entire civilian population that was located in the parts of the country, not only controlled by Qaddafi, but being um, defended by the population was obscured. So civilians were necessarily those who opposed Qaddafi and were in need of um, be, being saved or rescued through an intervention. And Qaddafi stood alone with his black mercenaries as the face of savagery in the country with a binary framing of savages and victims, sort of the classic core both imperial but also deeply racial framing of first world intervention in the third world. The permeable character of Libyan sovereignty justified um, by reducing half the country to the purported irrationality and barbarism of Qaddafi and then using a kind of racial synecdoche uh, of Qaddafi standing in uh, for one and the Libyan civilians uh, for the other uh, elements of the logic of imperial intervention travel through familiar tropes of third world savagery and the privilege of non-intervention that formal equality, formal sovereignty at the international level was supposed to entail was suspended so radically that the Security Council was able in a matter of really just three weeks from the beginning of protests in Libya to authorize military intervention directly. So that military intervention, which was framed as a, a humanitarian engagement designed to protect the you know the victims of savagery uh, framed in racialized terms quickly gave way following the intervention and the toppling of the Qaddafi regime to a new set of questions that raises the basic problematic if you want of both toil and CRT which is whose security is law designed to protect or in what ways does law mobilize languages of security and intervention in order to protect and shore up essentially what amount to a sort of core set of white interests, um, in this case, the interest of Europe um, uh, to be secured against what has now gone from being the object of humanitarian rescue to suddenly the incubator of terrorist threat. So the state collapse that followed the R2P based intervention, so a humanitarian intervention, which itself provoked the destruction essentially of state infrastructure in the country, um, immediately set aside the international responsibilities that might have been engaged to protect the humanitarian welfare of civilian populations in Libya proper. Instead, Libyan, now largely understood as Arabs, were almost immediately reframed as potential ISIS recruits, as sources of terrorist threat, indeed not of rescue, but of containment, because they uh, were on the Mediterranean, of course, and the risk that terrorism from Libya might spill over and have effects on the northern shores of the Mediterranean became the priority framework through which the country's disintegration was to be understood, no longer concerned at all with the welfare of the civilians trapped in a circumstance um, of, of destroyed infrastructure, but rather European security um, as the primary objective, which itself uh, is to be secured now by very much the same means. So if earlier humanitarian welfare required intense aerial bombardment of Libya, now containment of the terrorist threat justified precisely the same kinds of intervention. So as one example, that's of um, a small number of uh, Western nationals, um, individuals that were based in Benghazi at the US uh, embassy, 
produced a free fire zone in that city in which um, fundamentally one could see staged the reality that civilian slaughter in the third world, in the global south, is often the corollary of earlier imperatives of civilian rescue. Libyan sovereign consent itself was, of course, no longer a relevant category in determining the uses and legality of force, drone strikes, and scorched earth campaigns in places like Sirte in Libya proceeded with no account at all of whether or how to take um, into account the sovereignty of the Libyan state. And the country and its people became a laboratory for counterterrorism experimentation. Indeed, the scorched earth campaign that was undertaken in Sirte was, uh, you know, referred to uh, several times as a test run for anti-ISIS campaign strategies that would later be applied in places like Raqqa in Syria and Mosul uh, in Iraq. So if there is a transformation from an object of humanitarian rescue to a site for containment of terrorist threat, containment was also the important and relevant category for understanding the borders of Libya. While those borders didn't constitute forms of sovereignty that would protect those within from the forms of military intervention I've described, we also go through an analysis of the ways in which those borders nonetheless had to be constructed as racial borders um, in order to contain the capacity of Libya to serve as a transit site where um, African, so-called non-Libyan Black Africans would be um, seeking to transit again to Europe. So once again, a containment of a threat to Europe, this time framed in terms of just human migration, became another way for international law to visit a regime of governance and population management on Libyan soil. Uh, so Libya presented as a transit site for black Africans, required Europe to enact its racial borders on Libyan territory and territorial waters. As with the intervention and counterterrorism frames, migration control also then operated as a site not only of international legal framing, but specifically of racialized governance in Libya. Libya Libya's borders themselves came to be co-constituted by external sovereigns, playing a crucial role in the long-term European project of excluding third world migrants from European territory and waters. Race became the central vector for enabling the exclusion of migrants because migrants were framed and their bodies were transformed through racial proxies into um, the very site on which international law and legal governance regimes had to operate. The containment of black Africans within Libya and then eventually, as we narrate in the paper, even um, a governance regime that enabled their exploitation and enslavement became the kind of racially specific mechanism through which migrant illegality came to be produced once again on Libyan soil. So through these three different snapshots of just the first four to five years following the intervention in Libya, we can see how race operates to define who is the op proper object for the protection of law. Then again, where uh, and how governance strategies are to ma manage and maintain particular forms of quite coercive intervention for the purposes of containment. And finally, whose security and whose borders are constituted through the deployments of international law against a backdrop of global hierarchy in which, and as uh, Tendai ably began, uh, the relations between states are organized around um, dynamics of subordination. So I'll stop there with our illustrative case and invite you at the very end of our presentation, as we did at the beginning, to look at our article and the other articles featured in the symposium issue in order to get even a deeper sense of the kind of research that we both tried to perform in this case, but also that we invited. Well, thank you so very much for such a rich, um, fascinating and stimulating set of remarks that have both uh, summarized brilliantly the state of these two fields and their intersection, and also offered some new and original insights on them, including through these illuminating examples. And also, um, I, I was struck um, on a personal level by your wonderful collaborative, mutually supportive approach and find that wonderfully inspiring. Uh, we've had lots of questions that have come in, so I'll try to cluster them um, uh, into um, three, three groups. Um, so firstly, questions around uh, CRT and mainstream politics. Secondly, a twail standing in the international legal canon today. 
And then um, thirdly, um, uh, as it were, what might be described as conceptual challenges, including your own personal um, individual choices that you, you've made there and what, what influenced those um, uh, choices. So this is perhaps uh, uh, um, the first set of questions, um, perhaps inevitable at this particular moment in, in time. Um, obviously ideas from CRT are being discussed in the mainstream, in mainstream politics in certain countries, including the, the US, the country that you're both based in, um, as never before, and in mainstream politics. And, and we've heard the terms CRT uh, and intersectionality invoked by and discussed by politicians. How have you reacted to that development? Um, and how uh, does this raise concerns um, about how um, the arguments are understood and described? Um, and what do you think is, um, how should people respond to that who are working within uh, this tradition? Um, how do you address the concern that bad faith actors are, of course, deploying these terms? Um, how do you respond to that? Tendai, do you want me to give it a go to start? Okay. Um, I mean, there's, you know, from, of course, within a CRT analysis, there's nothing surprising about what's happening at the mainstream level. So at the moment, the United States and its polarized politics proceed through a series of culture wars. And at this point, we're witnessing the Republican Party sort of transform itself into the, the party of white nationalism and white supremacy. So it's very unsurprising that any um, suggestion that race is being grappled with at any point at from you know kindergarten through university education in the United States that the you know the histories of US practices um, the founding understanding of the Constitution would be um, interrogated from perspectives that are informed by the histories of slavery Jim Crow and then contemporary forms of de jure and de facto discrimination that is going to be a triggering point um, for a project that is understands itself as self-consciously defending white prerogative. And we're in a moment um, at, in domestic politics in the United States where much of this is framed through a fear of demographic change. So the idea that we may at one point become a majority minority um, country in which the white uh, population will be remain the largest by far plurality but not a straightforward majority. And so what all of this stages, at least um, to my mind, and I'd be uh, very much excited to be in conversation with Tendai about this as well, is that we have no experience, whether in the United States or more broadly uh, in Europe and, and beyond, with multiracial democracy. If there has been any experience at all with grappling with multiracial democracy, it is in the global South. In the global North, democracy was established you know, on a firmish footing, uh, maybe at, really in Europe after World War II in, in many respects and in uh, the United States through these wrenching experiences, um, including the Civil War, but with all kinds of exclusions that really um, call into question the democratic character of the state until once you get through at least desegregation as a formal matter. But in all of these moments, whether in Europe or in the United States, the construction of the democratic polity depended on a presumption, oftentimes implicit, but nonetheless a presumption of a white majority. And that was also often you know, gained through wrenching experiences of ethnic cleansing, even genocide, whether it's a, a native populations or of the wrenching wars on the continent of Europe. When that implicit or explicit presumption of white racial majority is called into question, as it may be by migration patterns in the context of Europe, and as it is as a consequence of shifting demographics domestically in the United States, it turns out that our commitments to democracy are somewhat more shallow than might be imagined, and it becomes very important suddenly to establish mechanisms institutionally and otherwise to manage uh, this demographic reality to secure increasingly sort of precarious white majorities through electoral tricks, uh, through institutional design, where they don't exist in the underlying population. So against this backdrop, when that's the project of one of the main parties in the United States, the fact that race is going to be at the center of mainstream politics is of course absolutely no surprise. It's just a different way of describing the analysis I just provided. And then in that context, 
uh, how are you going to characterize the challenge presented by anybody who has an account that embraces um, demographic change, that embraces the multiracial character of the underlying polity, however much it remains challenged in its practices of democracy, well, it's important to try to find any kind of stand-in to serve as um, a proxy. And so that is the role that CRT is playing. It's not an it's not a mainstream engagement with CRT, far from it, nor is it a mainstream grappling with the arguments of CRT. It's just a deployment of CRT in a very specific way. On the other hand, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to center conversations on the actual project of CRT and the actual analyses. And I think there is a really extraordinary and in some ways, to my mind, quite exciting moment for entering the sort of public arena, as you say, in a very much grappling with these um, straightforward sort of um, racial dynamics in the mainstream and to try to disrupt them and to try to have a sort of foot in the door of, ha of staging a conversation that's a little both more critical and more sophisticated because of the sort of opening that's been created by Republican politics. But I'll, I'll turn to Tendai. And, and this is why I enjoy being on, on panels with us because she's so brilliant. I get to just be like, I agree with everything she said, which I do. I think that's a really powerful analysis of the situation. And, and I think what I would add is that, you know, attempts to marginalize racial analysis are not anything new, you know, and I, I've seen this most powerfully in the context of my work as, as special rapporteur, but I think you don't have to be special rapporteur to have experienced this, you know, part of our symposium uh, efforts, you know, in focusing race and human rights was a response to the fact that the human rights canon hasn't really taken seriously race and racial subordination. And so there's, there's erasures there exist, you know, many of the audience members may know that a few years ago, France took out race from its constitution and repl replaced it with sex equality on this idea that even mentioning the term race is to harken back to kind of biological determinism that's been rejected and yet racialization remains palpable um, in a place like France. So the idea that um, race analysis is marginalized is not anything new and I think it just speaks to the marginalization of racially subordinated groups that even addressing the issue is something that has been um, mar marginal. Now the demonization and the backlash that that we're witnessing against CRT specifically right now, I think is remarkable in some sense. You know, CRT has been around for a really long time. Within the academy, I think it has been marginal for many, many reasons we could go into that have to do with the ways in which liberalism is invested in masking the systemic nature, nature of, of, of racism. But the demonization, I think, is in part related to um, what we saw last year, which was a moment of what felt like transnational reckoning with racial injustice, right? The naming of a systemic critique of racism that is related to that image that you showed at the start of your of your slide, right? And that I think is a huge part of what's mobilized, mobilized conversations like the ones that we have had. And I think in the face of the kinds of conversations that people were pushing for and the kind of abolitionist change that, that, that groups were pushing for last year, and not just Black Lives Matter, but the many, many people who took to the streets in different parts of the world. I think that has to be seen as a part of what we're seeing now, this backlash. This backlash, I think, is in many ways performing a CRT analysis, right? Because it's an attempt to really push back against any idea that there is something systemic about the nature of, of racism um, in the world. And so I think those things are things to, 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 to keep in mind. And then in terms of, you know, is this, is this a, a worst case scenario? It, could it be that CRT could be introduced to the general public in a different way that didn't involve this kind of demonization and tokenism that completely distorts the nature of the project? I think in order for that to happen, we would have to live in a different world, right? We would have to live in a world where structures of racial subordination were not so deeply embedded as to normalize the dehumanization of black people and other non-white people in different parts of the world. And that's not the world that we live in. So for me personally, as a CRT scholar, I couldn't, I, I, I can't conceive of a world where there would be a, you know, let's hold hands and now just talk about CRT in honest, honest terms and less power relations had been shifted. So again, I don't think it's surprising that we're seeing this kind of demonization at a point where there are very strong political forces invested in undercutting the underlying project of shifting power in, in more equitable um, ways. And as Asa mentioned, I think it's about 
taking advantage of this window that's been created to continue to do the work that CRT scholars have been doing. I, I don't think CRT, CRT scholars are doing anything other than continuing to try and produce, you know, really penetrating analyses of the ways in which race and law are so deeply intertwined domestically within the US, but then all over the world as well. Fantastic, thank you. The next set of questions relate to TWAIL and its standing in international law today. So, so um, of course, TWAIL has become um, a more established field within international law, certainly compared to ASLA when you and I were students 25 years ago. And I remember students secretly sharing an, uh, an early piece by Chimney for our own personal discussion when this tradition wasn't mentioned in the international law course we were taking. Now, more people know about our teaching and even themselves adopting um, in their own work, 12 approaches. What challenges does that raise for the field, do you think? To what extent do the same challenges continue to present themselves and what new challenges are raised by the different time we're in and the passage of Twail into broader circulation? And following on from that, um, uh, as it were, a more specific uh, question that's come in, um, uh, the questioner asks, how should the rise of what the questioner calls non-white superpowers, particularly China, be understood from the 12 framework? Is China an object of third world solidarity or a likely future perpetuator of the racialized frameworks prevalent in Euro-American views of international law? Asa, should I, should I take our first step? Um, so I guess with the first question, I would ask whether is Twail really in broad circulation, you know, and, and I, I think relative likely to, to the period you were describing, Ralph, it's definitely the case that I wish I had been a student with the two of you because that must have been um, a phenomenal course or classroom to have been in. But I would even question how mainstream, or even whether Twail is approaching any kind of mainstream within the field of international law. I do think that in the last two years, there has been greater visibility of um, twelve scholars, for example. Uh, you know, uh, but I don't. I, but not in a way that, to me, speaks to a mainstreaming of the project in, in any real way among academics or even within the, the UN context. So I, I don't think we're there yet. And I, I, I as a twelve scholar, I think there remains a lot of work to be done to actually establish the legitimacy of these methods. And one of the articles in the symposium that we were talking about actually discusses the ways in which critical approaches such as TWAIL and CRT are often dismissed um, by the mainstream in different ways, you know, where, where the rigor of the project is, is, is contested, you know, uh, different ways of, of kind of diffusing the nature of the critique. So that's the first thing that I'll say. That said, um, I don't think even if Twail remains marginal, it can remain the way it has been. And I think you see sh growth and change within, within um, Twail. You know, Anthony Angian and um, B.S. Chimney have talked about Twail 1, Twail 2. Um, at the conference that was held in Singapore, there was discussion of a, of, a, of a Twail 3. And I think the idea is that this approach is one that should be flexible and adapted to the nature of subordination that is being um, experienced. I don't think that the legacies of colonialism have been fully exhausted or anywhere near close. And for as long as that is the case, I think Twail still remains um, urgent. At the same time, I don't think it can claim to exhaust or occupy the entire field of emancipatory thought um, that is required. And I think any approach that attempts to do that is imperial. <laughs> and, and I think the last thing that Twail wants to do is, is, be, uh, is be imperial, right? Or, or and, and I guess there's people who talk about hegemony and imperialism kind of going hand in hand. But I, I feel so far away from a world where Twail is hegemonic that it, it seems like a luxury sort of um, concern to have, which is not to say that they aren't serious issues to be resolved within the field of Twail. It's just that to me, that's not one of them. And then I think this ties nicely to the question about, about China. You know, I think similarly, China could be and is and has been subjected by Twail scholars to an analysis that treats China as, as an imperial power, which it is, and, and as, as having an imperial legacy that, can, that a Twail analysis that can get, engage with that treats China in those terms. And at the same time, an analysis that also 
thinks about the different ways in which first world hegemony can place China into the position of a racialized nation that is more analogous to a third world country than to another one. So I think the kind of fluidity and nuance that is required to deal with a case like China is the kind of nuance that I would hope would flourish within Twail, where there's humility about not claiming to exhaust and unoccupy, but there's also a sensitivity to the ways in which imperial dynamics of different kinds flourish and are embedded in legal projects in ways that require serious attention by international lawyers. Yeah, that's a fantastic response. And I'll just um, say again, uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be in this conversation and to be with this particular group. And Ralph, this also applies to how you're framing our conversation, which I think is directing us to some really great ways of thinking and grouping the kinds of questions that are coming in. And of course, it's amazing always to listen to Tendai describe, you know, respond uh, and how her mind thinks. So anyway, thank you both again. Um, on this, I would just say only two small addenda. Um, the first is that the politics of knowledge production are actually quite complex. And so even if it was a world in which TWAIL was a unit on a syllabus in most mainstream international law classes, which I agree with Tendai, that's simply not the world we're in. But even then, it would be a kind of compartmentalized and quite, I mean, in, in the way that other sort of critical engagements also uh, tend to be sort of all grouped together. In fact, I can almost visualize the syllabus that's like, that says, you know, TWAIL, feminist, and other, and then just fills in some blanks and puts in this category. And the trouble there is that, you know, the central dynamics of both how the discipline reproduces itself, how knowledge is produced in the discipline, and what counts as, you know, sort of serious scholarship remains unperturbed, even as we replicate the very dynamic that's under study in TWAIL or in CRC of formal equality. So like, you know, the methods are brought in, there's some kind of, you know, symbolic acknowledgement, but there's no understanding that if you, if you were to embrace the basic insights, you would have to thoroughly rethink the approach to the discipline as a whole. And that I think is we're, we're very, very far from. And then the China question, I think, again, replicates this because if we are, I mean, as uh, Tendai has already described, we may be at 12, 4.0 or whatever that would mean. It's basically a project that is inclusive and generous and, and is interested in the ways in which people want to think about, for example, the fourth world. The third world, as she said, is not a geographic place. And it's not a specific narrowly construed racial category either, but rather a terrain of subordination. And so it would be important to see what dynamic is China producing and reproducing. But there's a critique within Twelve, obviously, of third world states themselves, right? I mean, where there's no contestation as to how we would understand the state, we understand them to be involved in projects of subordination. And those projects are themselves embedded in colonial histories, imperial logics, and so forth. They deploy and leverage the very power dynamics that are at the center of the analysis in ways that are deeply problematic and themselves in need of critical scrutiny. So on the one hand, we can see once again staged in responses to the rise of China, the very problem, the knowledge production problem I began um, my response with as, you know, the international rules based order is asserted as some kind of normative telos that has been achieved in one part of the world and now is being threatened in another by the rise of another part of the world. The treatment of any tradition that is not a Eurocentric tradition as normatively both inferior and necessarily dysfunctional without any actual engagement. What would it mean? We see, for example, the Chinese Journal of International Law, just as an example on the knowledge production side, as being a very interesting space that is opening up and more plural. That's a very different account than the monolithic, you know, uh, anti sort of, uh, well, the monolithic imperial ambitions of China as a whole and the kind of anti-critical alleged lenses that are present in an autocratic space, So, it's, which is not to at all cut against um, the reality that there are also authoritarian practices and indeed even ethnic cleansing and genocidal practices within China. So that you need to take the, the analytic project and apply it in a complex and sophisticated way to analyzing any state and its actions any state and its location in the international system and the dynamics that responses to all of that produce. And I think that's what Twail would invite. There's no simple therefore answer to how do we see China other than we bring the project to a more sort of narrowly framed question and we see how China is in fact interacting. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I could uh, put questions to you and listen to to both of you all day. And and I'm unfortunately, um, we have only f five minutes left. So I'm going to put to you perhaps the most fundamental uh, question that's that's come in. 
relating to, as it were, a theoretical approach. So Asla, you mentioned um, it, the focus on critical engagement with the law, leading to critique committed to change within and through law. And of course, this could also lead ultimately to a more drastic rejection of law itself. And of course, that dilemma, that choice, however one would describe it, is implicates the much broader tension in critical theory between deconstruction and reconstruction. On a personal level, for the two of you in your own work, um, what position have you taken here and, and how have you arrived at that position? Do you want me to go first, Asla? Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll go first and I'll be brief. Um, so I, I think that to me, I think two, two big things. One is in general among lawyers, even among critical lawyers, among toilers, among CRT scholars, I think we have done, we haven't done enough to truly reimagine um, the world that we want to live in. So there's, I think there is a pressure and an urgency to really invest in that work of reimagining, that constructive work of reimagining beyond reform and repair of existing structures. You know, what might an alternative world look like that was entirely kind of equitable and all these sorts of things. I think that imagination work is work that is urgent and that must be done. At the same time, I think it's a luxury that we cannot afford to completely abandon law at this time and maybe even in future times. We are so far from the kinds of ideals that might be the ones we all believe in and the violence of law is palpable. It's all around us. And, and I think there is a luxury quality to be able to wash one's hands entirely of structures of subordination when literally people um, are dying. I think about this in the context of my, of my rapporteurship where I'm somebody who is critical to the bone but I'm presenting reports to the UN and doing all kinds of things that don't seem um, very critical. And I, I think it's about a form of double consciousness and now I'm abusing you with the origins of that term but what I'm trying to get at is the urgency of reimagining is truly there, but it is a luxury to imagine that we wash our hands clean of law as it is and just focus on that reimagining because lives are, are on the line. That's, that's how I see it. Thank you. I would only add very briefly to this that one practice that both CRT and Toil direct us to is thinking about how communities themselves in a kind of grounded fashion imagine emancipatory projects. And so that invitation I think helps resolve this tension because if your object of study and the, the sort of deployments of law are responsive to grounded experiences through which people themselves are articulating an emancipatory agenda, then your obligations as a scholar become much clearer, um, which is to bring the analytic apparatus to really provide even a, a larger stage where possible, both intellectually, but also politically to those same actors. And so I feel as if we're very privileged to be in a position in which we can have the space to do that work and, and it comes with an obligation to engage with it. And so because communities are grappling with lived experiences as Tendai says, oftentimes refracted through law, there is no option that is outside of the law entirely, while at the same time, they speak in a language of emancipation that exceeds what the law can provide and exceeds what the law even can imagine. And so really marrying those moves is something that we can ourselves do in part through the inspiration provided by the communities we work on, for, about, and through. Well, thank you so very much for such deeply insightful and important remarks on this vital subject and also for giving up your precious time uh, to prepare and, and, and deliver these remarks. I'm so very grateful to you uh, both. Our next, next lecture is entitled Decolonizing Humanity and is with Aicha Chubuchku of LSE. And it will be on the 7th of February. I look forward to seeing you all then. Um, in the meantime, all my best wishes and thanks to the speakers and to my colleagues again, Lisa, Jess and Danielle, and to everyone watching. Goodbye.